Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Paul Ricard here in the south of France as we get ready for the first race of the fifth round of the 2012 International GT Open. The second half of the season starts now with the first race of the weekend, which is the longer 70-minute race. It's a beautiful day here at the Paul Ricard high-tech test track, about 25 miles to the northeast of Marseille. We've got a large crowd basking in the sunshine and ready for what promises to be a very entertaining race from the International GT Open. My name's Ben Evans, alongside me in the Contra Box this weekend. Delighted to be joined by the current uh, ELMS Ferrari racer, Johnny Cocker. And Johnny, qualified this morning, we saw it was the Villa Racing Aston Martin, which absolutely dominated. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Like Ben says, absolutely gorgeous weather here at Paul Ricard today, if a little bit windy. Um, but no, Malicelli did an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, in the Aston Martin Vantage, taking pole by quite a decent margin, just over six tenths of a second. So, no, it's, uh, it's going to be set for a really interesting race. I'm really intrigued myself to just see how they get on there. Should be very close because Matteo Malicelli and Alvaro Bob, they won last weekend at Brands Hatch, and then the teams had a long drive and a very short turnaround before coming to Paul Ricard this weekend. So will Barbara and Malicelli be able to make it two on the bounce or will it be the car that's second on the grid this one of Gian Maria Bruni Jimmy Bruni and Federico Leo twice winners already in the 2012 season and Jimmy Bruni starting that car promises to go very well Bruni really established as the man you turn to if you want a Ferrari GT car driven quickly if you're new to the International GT Open then to explain there are two classes in the International GT Open there is the Super GT class and the GTS class the Super GT class is broadly speaking GT2 cars but then with a few little tweaks made by the championship organizers to keep things as competitive as possible and the GTS class broadly speaking GT3 cars again with a few tweaks to keep things even another former Formula 1 driver it is in third position that is Andrea Montermini who has had one victory to his name already this year that came at the Nürburgring for he and Juan Manuel Lopez they're coming off the back of a successful weekend just six days ago at Brands Hatch where they claimed a third and fourth position I was talking to Andrea after qualifying this morning he felt that maybe there was a little bit more time to come from the car fifth on the grid it is the championship leading car of Marco Holzer and Nick Tandy it's Marco who starts the Manti Racing Porsche they have had a very successful season thus far three wins to their credit although it was a win this weekend at Brands Hatch they were second in the first race 12th in the second race after the car briefly caught fire as they left the pits off their pit stop and that put them well down and out of the points the cars making an absolutely beautiful sight lined up here on the grid ready for the start of the race and at the head of the GTS class it's Archie Hamilton in the Auto Orlando Sport Porsche he and Marco Mapelli have really been the fine turn of form. They went superbly well at Brands Hatch last weekend in qualifying this morning as well, Johnny. Archie was very impressive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he had a, a great run in the Porsche there. Um, I think we saw all the strengths of the Porsche as well in that qualifying session, really apparent uh, versus the Ferrari, especially out of all the, the first sector, the Porsche was absolutely flying. Uh, and then the last sector, where you, you have to rely on all this aero and uh, real balance in the car, the Ferrari was very quick as well. So be interesting to see how the race pans out now with the tyre degradation uh, and the fight between the two cars. Yeah, very much so. Also showing very well is the second of the Auto Orlando Sport Porsches. This one in the hands of Matteo Beretta, who's made the jump up from the European F3 Open this weekend. Or well, last weekend, the brand actually was in the International GT Open and continuing this weekend in the second of the Auto Orlando Sport Porsches. And he was, again, showing very strongly in qualifying earlier on, as was a little bit lower down the order, Michele Rugolo. And Rugolo then getting ready to start his AF course Ferrari. He is fifth on the GTS grid, as we've got just a minute to go before they set off on their formation that behind the pace car. As ever, races in the National GT Open get underway with a rolling start. Paul Ricard, a very different challenge for the drivers, Johnny, than Brands hatched last week, whereas Brands is reasonably tight and twisty. Here, wide open space is the chance for the drivers to open up their right feet and, and really pick up some speed. But then, as you said, the final third of the lap is actually quite different to the first two thirds in that it's more twisty, it's technical and some slower corners. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Paul Ricard here as the, uh, you know, in this circuit configuration, especially with the chicane in the main straight, um, 
when he, we, we were here with the European Le Mans series, we ran the whole back straight, which had, you know, changes the, the feel of the track again to more like a Le Mans type feel. But, but certainly, I think, you know, this nice mix of GT cars, we saw the Aston was very quick in qualifying, uh, and the Porsche and the Ferrari have all, you know, got their own strengths as well. And uh, I really, yeah, I think, uh, I think this should be shaping up for a really decent race here. This circuit definitely brings good racing. Uh, and we'll see the start of this lap just as we approach the cars come into the first corner now on the first green flag lap. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the first uh, the first corner of this race. Everybody spreading out down the straight, loads of space, all funnels into that first narrow corner. It certainly will be a very lively start to the race as the drivers just weaving around, getting a little bit of heat into those Dunlop control tyres. It's a slightly harder compound for the teams this weekend. And it has rather unsettled some of the Ferrari drivers. They felt the setup wasn't quite as they liked for the Porsches. It's always the challenge of the, the inherent traction, the mechanical grip of that car, really is leading to slightly higher levels of tyre degradation. We just caught a glimpse there of Nico Pronk in his Lamborghini Gallardo, which he shares with Peter Cox. So we can expect that car to come up through the order as this 70 race, 70 minute race progresses because there is a mandatory pit stop, there is a mandatory driver change. That must become. That must happen between 40% and 60% race distance. So we'll expect to see the pits getting very busy during that period. We've got one car that's going to start from the pit lane. That is the Mosler of Rafael Unzarazaga. He's just gone past our contra box position as the crowd here. 28 degrees heat, although a, a nice stiff breeze, meaning it feels a little bit cooler than that. As we take a look, Johnny, at these blue and red lines at the edge of the circuit. Now, that's a very different approach to runoff. What will exactly they signify? What, what impact do they have? Yeah, I mean, Paul Ricard um, was uh, something of a revelation, uh, revelation when they, you know, came out with this this new uh, kind of gravel traps, if you like. Um, the blue is a, a very, very high grip surface uh, tarmac, and the red is extremely high grip. It's almost difficult to, to even slide your shoe against, you know, if you go and walk the track. Uh, this is just to basically avoid, um, you know, using the, the, the use of tyre barriers or gravel traps. Uh, which you know inevitably use uh, use energy in, in the car to slow them down. This this you know they obviously destroy a set of tyres if you go off the track, but it'll save the car. You don't have any damage. It doesn't break the suspension. Um, and you know, certainly um, it's a good and bad thing as a driver point of view. Maybe it gives you a little bit too much confidence every now and again. So let's take a look then at the starting grid with Matteo Malicelli in pole position, Jimmy Brilli alongside him on the front row, Andrea Montoni and Miguel Ramos building on his third place at Brown's Hatch in fourth. Marco Holzer and Philip Petter are very, very strong. Row three, fifth and sixth on the grid. Patrick Pile is in seventh and Archie Hamilton the first of the GTS cars in eighth with his teammate Matteo Bretta in ninth. Renzo Bontempelli, welcome back to the championship for Lorenzo and he was in fine form in qualifying completing the top ten with then Stefano Pizzari and Michele Ruglo making the Ferrari row six of the grid. Steve Pies, a driver we haven't seen thus far this year in the championship, he's in 13th position then Alexander Taukanitsa senior lines up in 14th Andrea Cecalero in 15th with then Nico Pronk and Rafael Unzarazaga completing a very healthy 22 car grid as they come towards the end of the long back straight they're now working through the very twisty and tight turn 11 there is the Auto Orlando sports squad ready and waiting there is the Mose that we referred to a few moments ago that will be starting from the pit lane but Rafael Unzarazaga was at the back of the grid anyway, so he's not actually going to be losing too much ground as a result of that. So they're about ready for the rolling start. Who is going to get the job? Will it be Matteo Balicelli in that Vilwa Racing Aston Martin, or will it be the AF Course Ferrari 458 of Jimmy Brunny? We're about to find out because the pace is slowed down. The pace car will very shortly be peeling into the pit lane, and then we'll be getting underway for 70 minutes of racing for the ninth race in the 2012 International GT Open in absolutely perfect conditions here at Paul Ricard. So just coming up now to the very tight turn 15, the last corner on the circuit. Thereafter, they will see the red lights on the starting gantry. When they flash to green, the race will get underway. They file out two by two. The red lights are on. Who's going to get the jump here at Paul Ricard as we wait for those lights to turn green? Here they go, and away rockets the field. It's a brilliant start from Jimmy Brunning, but the Aston Martin is trying to draw alongside. Also a good start as well from Andrea Montermini as the field fan out towards turn one. Who's going to get 
the line through though it's Brunny who's disputing it with Malicelli they go side by side through the first turn and it is just Malicelli the pole sitter who holds on in the lead Jimmy Brunny is in second Alexander Talkanitsa takes to the escape route he should rejoin as the leading duo is still locked in battle Andrea Montermini it is in third position Miguel Ramos in fourth Philip Petter in fifth Marco Holzer in sixth being challenged by Patrick Pile in the IMSA performance Matt Foot Porsche as now Bruni snatches the lead away from Matteo Malicelli so it's Jimmy Bruni who takes the lead but very shortly they're going to come onto that long back straight now will we see the Aston Martin be able to power past in these early stages yeah I think that big V12 in the Aston he's going to be looking forward to getting onto that straight now and getting the, the advantage of the toe uh, against the Malicelli uh, Aston Martin you know just Absolutely fantastic start by Jimmy there. Uh, he, he knew what he had to do. He needs to get out of the way of the Aston Martin, get going and, and be gone. Uh, and he really stacked up in the middle of the, in the middle of the pack there as well. So good job by everybody. And we see the pass into the chicane. Patrick Pile moving ahead of Marco Holzer. And certainly for the Porsche teams looking after those tyres over this 70-minute race duration is going to be absolutely key. But now that Bruni has got the lead, he really is pulling away as he heads into the very quick turn. He's probably got... A, well over a second, the second and a half, the monitor showing us at the end of sector two. And so Brittany, not only has he taken the lead, he is really putting the hammer down in these early stages. Then we've got this big queue forming up behind us. We've got a spin further back, and it's Alexander Talkin, it's the senior who's had a wretched first lap. He's had two offs already, and he's now pointing in the wrong direction. The extra turn 10 as Malicelli comes under a little bit of, bit of pressure from Andrea Montermini with then Miguel Ramos closing in onto his tail as well in the Corvette, then Philip Petter, then Patrick Pile, and Marco Holzer. That group of cars pulling clear of the two Auto Orlando Sport Porsches with Hamilton just ahead of Bretta in the early stages fighting for the GTS lead. So they come through on to Turn 15 to complete the first lap of the race. It's been a very lively first lap, but it's Bruni who leads it by 2.6 seconds already over Matteo Malicelli. Then Andrea Montermini a further second back. Jimmy Bruni, though, has done exactly what he needed to do and that sort of gap is going to be very difficult to close down as we've got a challenge going on from Andrea Cecalero who tries to move to the inside of Stefano Pizzari and through goes Cecalero. Brave move right out to the edge of the circuit on the inside but he was able to squeeze through so he gains the place as Bruni pulls away in the lead. Just absolutely stunning first lap there by Jimmy Bruni. You know, like I said, he needed, he needed to just get gone, get out of the way, get out of the toe uh, and not have that Aston anywhere near him and uh, 2.6 seconds on the first lap, you know, what more could you ask for? Particularly as one of his championship ri rivals, Marco Holzer, has had a slightly disappointing first lap. He slipped back into seventh position. There is Archie Hamilton who leads the GTS class and it's his teammate Matteo Bretta who is next up as they head along this very, very lengthy Mistral straight. Are we going to see a challenge for anybody here? Possibly Patrick Pile in the background of your shot. He draws alongside the Kessel Racing Ferrari and through he goes another place gained them by Patrick Pile and Philip Petter under a little bit of pressure at the moment because not only has he lost the place to Pile, he's now being pressurised by the Manti Racing Porsche. And I just wonder if Petter might have a slight issue. No, he doesn't because Holzer are unable to draw alongside him. The cars fan out along the second half of the Mistral straight into the quick right-hander at turn 10 there is Lorenzo Bontepelli he is third in the GTS class and staying very much in touch with the class leaders Marco Holzer looking increasingly anxious to get through and he moves to the inside into turn 11 shutting the door there Philip Petter and Holzer all the while he can see Pile pulling away that was assertive defense though from Philip Petter he's a difficult drive to pass as Marco Holzer's finding out I think we can see Holzer here is definitely getting held up by the Ferrari um, front end of the Porsche just looks a lot more eager I mean I know myself from driving the Ferrari these first couple of laps um, you know it does take a little while to get the tyres working and uh, we, I think we can really see that with the Kessel Ferrari here just struggling to keep the Porsche behind and uh, the Porsche is heavier on its tyres so it works sooner uh, and that's really kind of becoming apparent now. Yeah Philip Petter was saying after qualifying as well earlier on that he, he felt he'd gone the wrong direction with the setup in qualifying and he's hoped he'd fix it for the race and maybe he would have done for the whole race duration but at the moment he really does seem to be struggling as Holzer closing up onto his tail Patrick Pile meanwhile is trying to close in now on to Miguel Ramos in fourth position some good battles going on throughout the GTS class as well as the drivers running very closely in the early stages of this race and we really have seen some tight and competitive racing over the course of this season now 
something else to be aware of if you've not watched the international GT Open before is that the way the performance of Zeke flies down is by the addition of time to the mandatory pit stop. So if you win your class in the preceding race, you get 15 seconds added to your pit stop time. If you're second, you get 10 seconds. If you're third, you get five seconds. And that can accumulate for up to three races. What it means is that that second place car we're watching there now, Matteo Malicelli, has got to spend 15 seconds longer in the pits than the car just behind him of Andrea Monterme. We've got this super battle now, four cars disputing fourth position. And Marco Holzer has almost got the best best place here, Johnny, because he's at the back of that queue. He can really just buy his time, pick his moment. I think he just needs to be uh, a little bit cautious not to just blow the tyres too early on the push. Um, you know, he's obviously eager to get past the Ferrari and Petter, and um, he just needs to be careful because obviously it's still over an hour to go in the race. Um, it's important that he gets clear space, of course, but, you know, we need to think about the long haul. And uh, But for sure, I think I think he's going to have a decent go at the end of this lap, maybe. And certainly the challenge for Mark Holzer and Nick Tandy is really just collecting points because this year they've more or less either been winning or not finishing. They were involved in an incident with Jimmy Brunny at Nürburgring. That caused a retirement. Tire failure put them out in the first race at Spa. They're out of the points in the second race at Brands Hatch. So even though they don't win today's race, they do need to pick up a pretty solid points haul at the check and flag. And at the moment, Philip Petter is able to stay with Patrick Pile largely because Pile is bottled up behind Miguel Ramos in the Corvette, unable to really close up on Taylor Ramos to challenge him for position. But again, Holzer gets a good run out of Turn 15. Will he be able to challenge the Kessel Racing Ferrari this time around as they head along the start and finish straight and through to complete another lap? Holzer thinking about the inside line towards Turn 1, but he's not quite near enough. And really, if Holzer's going to do it, it's going to require something very bold on the brakes, and it's not that point in the race. Johnny, as you rightly say, with over an hour to go, for Holzer to start taking too many risks. Yeah, I think he's, you know, he's got to be careful, of course. You know, he doesn't want to risk any any damage. Uh, you know, Tandy's very, very quick in the car as well. Um, so there's no doubt that that Porsche is going to, throughout the race, going to be working its way up through the grid. Um, but Petter's doing a fantastic job of getting it, giving him a bit behind. And, uh, you know, he's defending well and, and certainly not holding either of them up too much. So uh, I think he's still keen to get by, but he's, uh, you know, he's being sensible about it as well. And also, I think it's fairly safe to say that Nick Tandy a little bit quicker than Philip Petter's co-driver, Michael Brosnitsky. Although that said, Brosnitsky put together a super drive last Saturday at Brands Hatch in the teeming rain to claim his first victory of the season. So he is going to offer fairly stout resistance here, Philip Petter. And he knows that Michael has got the pace to bring the car home in a very strong position. And now Holzer is showing his frustration, looking to the outside through the chicane midway down the Mistral straight turns eight to nine and then come into the second half of the straight and holds it losing a little bit of ground to Petra on the exit of turn eight a result of taking that wide swooping line in trying to force the issue so into turn 10 they come and that gap extends to about two car lengths between the sixth and seventh place cars and now Philip Petter for the first time in a couple of laps can actually start concentrating more on his windscreen and his rear view mirrors and set him out keeping Patrick Pile in touch and Pile in turn pretty much the same gap back to Miguel Ramos he was a couple of laps ago but the concern for all three of these drive drivers is that as they sit behind Miguel Ramos it's enabling Andrea Montermini to break away it's allowing Matteo Malicelli to break away and most importantly of all it's enabling Jimmy Brunis to build up a really very substantial lead as we're not yet 10 minutes into this race yeah I was just having a quick look at the timing screens there I mean you know Jimmy Bruni pulled 2.6 seconds on the first lap uh, and we're only seeing just over three seconds. Uh, oh no, just over four seconds now. So he's still he's still extending that lead over the, the P2 Aston. But you know this uh, that first lap was stunning, as I say, and, and that really just got him out of the trouble. And now he's just going to relax, do his stint. You know, good job and, uh, and out of trouble all the way. And how much will he be in communication with the team on the radio? What will they be telling him about what's going on and what, what he needs to do during the stint? Well, I mean, I doubt he's got much to much to hear or, or much to say, really, at this point in time. You know, he's just kind of head down, doing his laps. Um, you know, he, he'll just be looking after the tyres now. He's, he's totally in that position of strength whereby, you know, it's a nice feeling to have, certainly, being out front uh, without pressure behind you. And he can really just settle down and, and get some really good laps off. We caught a glimpse there just at the back of the shot with Matteo Beretta, who's moved ahead of Archie Hamilton. So it's now Beretta in the 55 Port Orlando Sport Porsche who leads the GTS class, Hamilton dropping to second in class, and then Lorenzo Bontempelli still third in class in the Ombre racing. 
Ferrari. So there, of course, Ferrari and Jimmy Brindley leads the race as Brindley rides up over the curve. Patrick Pile trying to close in on the Corvette, the Miguel Ramos. And we've still got Philip Petter and Marco Holzbath. And Holzer, having made that bid a lap ago that was more optimistic, really, the light has come off. He's now bringing himself right back onto the tail of Philip Petter. And it's going to be through the third sector of the lap that really plays the Porsche strength. And that probably is Holzer's best opportunity to try and fight his way through as Jimmy Bruni is on for a quick lap he's just on the fastest first sector of anybody in the race thus far there is Miguel Ramos in fourth position in the Corvette which he has been competing in since Spa and it's been, been going very well for Miguel Ramos and Rafael Giamaria they were third last weekend in the second race and Brand Hatcher's holes are now really piling the pressure on to Philip Petro runs out wide, but Holzer's got the outside line. He's going to try and force his way through, though. He keeps his foot in around the outside. That's a super move from Marco Holzer. He tries to squeeze through up the inside into turn 14. Unfortunately, nothing doing there. Then on towards turn 15, and it's the run. Then long start to straight. Give Philip Petro some momentary breathing space, but Marco Holzer, so much confidence in the grip of that Manti Racing Porsche as they streak through, then completing the lap. And Philip Petro just pulls out a car length or so over the Porsche into the braking zone then for turns one and two and the side effect of all of that battle is that Patrick Pile has just moved a little bit further away from Philip Petter so Petter now being forced Johnny to really take some defensive action it's enabling the fight for fourth and fifth to break clear which really for Mark Holzer means he's got to now try and find a way through on this lap I think we we're really starting to see some some proper frustration from the Porsche driver here Marco Holzer and uh, uh, Petter's driving very, 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 very intelligently. He's just he's he's been defensive without compromising himself too much. And we see once he's got that little gap again, he can go. Uh, the Porsche is extremely strong, as we see. Um, they're just coming onto the Minstrel straight now. This next uh, this next chicane here, the Porsche is extremely strong down the straight onto the braking areas. So we see a spin here from Miguel Amaral, who just keeps it off the red stripes, which would have forced him to pit in for a new set of tyres as the three leading cars in the GTS class run very closely together. And it is Matteo Bretta who leads that class from Archie Hamilton in second position. And into the pit lane, we have got Diderik Schutthoff in the Chevrolet Corvette. So unfortunately he and Nicky Pastorelli will go no further as Diderik stalks disconstantly into the pit garage, the other Corvette in the race though, that of Miguel Ramos, holds on to a very strong fourth position, Andrea Montermini in third, he's not really breaking too far clear either of that Corvette so this battle is just coming together, if anything Ramos possibly was catching Montermini over the course of that last lap because he seems to be bringing that guy down, so there's the third place law of the course at Ferrari of Andrea Montermini, there's Miguel Ramos, Patrick Pile not too far back and still Philip Petter and Marco Holzer in fairly close company out to turn 15 then accelerating through another lap consigned to the history books for Miguel Ramos in his pursuit of Andrea Montermini Marco Holzer still behind Philip Petter Matteo Malicelli we just saw him flash through in second position it's Jimmy Brini in the air of course Ferrari Corvette which leads the way and Andrea Montermini sliding the car through turn one he's really pushing so is Patrick Pile and Marco Holzer the rear of those Porsches both breaking away Johnny Absolutely, it's an absolute joy to watch these guys, you know, I mean, it's a 70-minute race, but everybody's absolutely on it today, and, uh, you know, like you say, the conditions are absolutely perfect, and uh, the cars look like they're working really well. I don't think we've quite seen the uh, the advantage of the, the tyre degradation working for the Ferrari quite yet. The Porsches are still very strong, uh, so that's something to look forward to, to see how that might just mix things up a little bit. We're certainly in the early stages of the race with 56 minutes remaining. We've got a, an all Ferrari squad a little bit further back as Michael Dallas Stella it is in the 44 car up onto the tail of Michele Rugolo in number 58. And the pair of them are behind Eraj Alexander in the number 51. As they head down the Mistral straight, the three leaders of the class have broken some way clear. Then in this queue, it's Andrea Cecalero who's at the head of it. Then it's Eraj Alexander. Then McKenny Ruglo, then Michael Dallas Stella. And these cars predominantly prepared by two different teams. Kessel Racing there, of course, there's an awful lot of inter-driver, but also inter-team rivalry going on here. The 56 car, that is currently in the hands of Stefano Bizzari. These cars all flying in formation 
along the Mistral Straight. And this is almost doubly tricky, Johnny, for these drivers to find a way through because the beauty of multi-mark racing is that some cars are stronger on different parts of the circuit to others. Here, where we've got a group of Ferrari Forfaits running together, there's going to be, aside from some very minor setup tweaks, very little differential between the cars, so it all comes down to really how ambitious the drivers are feeling. Yeah, I think, you know, this is a, a perfect example of, you know, the, the really strong drivers are going to show through here. Uh, the, the 51 there is just, he's just, he looks like he's got a little bit better front end on the car at the minute, and, uh, and certainly, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a move uh, in some of the slower areas of the track, but, but certainly this is just all about staying neat, staying tidy, looking after the tyres, and, uh, and as we see a dive there, great move, just uh, opportunistic, really great move, straight onto the straight now, great exit, and uh, move done. That was a brilliant move there, it was Michael Dallastella on Michele, Michele Rugolo, so Dallastella gaining the place now, will Rugolo be able to fight back? We've also got Erange Alexander who's trying to line up for the move with Andrea Cecalero, who moves across the circuit to take the racing line into turn one. And Erange Alexander, it really looked like he was going to try and fight through, but the rear of the car again breaking away on the exit of turn two. Just that little elevation change, it now means that Michael Dallastella is right up onto Alexander Alexandra. Dallastella's going to go for the move. He's got the inside line, and through he goes. So he gains two spaces in the place of three corners. And that was another very nicely judged opportunistic manoeuvre from Michael Dallastella. It brings him up into fifth position in the GTS class as he now sets off in pursuit of Andrea Cecalero. And Dallastella really saw those gaps and was able to launch for them. Patrick Pile now back in that battle for third position has just dropped back from Igor Ramos and is coming to pressure from Philip Petter. Now are we going to see the challenge from Dallas Stella on Chekalero as they accelerate along the Mistral straight into the chicane at turns eight and nine. I'm surprised actually just how much curb Johnny some of these drivers are taking. They really are leaping across them. Yeah, I mean, here at Paul Ricard, you see the cars bouncing up and down there, but I mean, the, the curves here are actually very, very gentle, and, and something that I've learned with, and, uh, with driving the Ferrari 458 this year for JMW Motorsport is just just how much curb you can take in these cars. It is just incredible. Um, you know, the car can just take it, and obviously th these guys are just shortening the distance that they're taking, uh, optimizing the line and, uh, and making the most out of it, but it really is quite amazing to see just how much curb, you know, from the outside point of view as well. And the car's bouncing up and down and uh, really taking some abuse, but they, they, they really handle it nicely. Are oh, we going to see a repeat here from Dallas Stella? Now he goes through the corner earlier and he gets absolutely no joy from his Kessel Racing teammate, Andrea Cecalero. So into turn 14 they come now. It's turn 15 where Dallas Stella made that move last time around to Michele Rugolo. Cecalero, though, wise to that one. Philip Petter, exactly as you said, Johnny. He's letting that Ferrari come to him. He's now bringing himself back up onto the tail of Patrick Pile. Now, partly that could be the Porsche's tyres are just beginning to move away from their prime. We're almost 20 minutes into this race. But also, it could be that Philip Petter, well, he said he was going to change the track setup quite dramatically after qualifying, and it really seems that that car is now coming to him. And he's right onto the tail of Patrick Pile, who's having to work very, very hard here now in the Ips performance map at Porsche to keep Philip Petter at bay. Pile had a wretched time last weekend at Brands Hatch when the car didn't even make it to the grid for the second race. And so he will be looking to score a solid points haul today. Andrea Cecalero and Michael Dallastella continue their battle, as do Eraj Alexander. And also Stefano Bizzari, who has been able to gain the place on McKenny Rugolo out of our sight. So now we've got really the classic GT battle of all time. Porsche versus Ferrari. Take another look at that move from Dallas Stella. And that would have caused quite a spike in blood pressure in the Kessel Racing Garage. You don't want to see your two cars running that closely. No, I think uh, I think he definitely gave him a bit of room there and, uh, and ended up just backing out a bit nice and early. But here we see uh, Pile, I think he's just starting to struggle with the front tyre on that Porsche. And, and as I said earlier, Petter's just letting the car come to him. And uh, I think he's really dragged Holzer up there as well because everybody's, you know, just... Uh, just starting to catch the Corvette too, so it's um, it's certainly. I think we're just starting to, to see the first signs of the uh, of the differences in these cars and, and, and the advantages of the Ferrari over the Porsche in terms of tire degradation. Now, where, if at all, will Philip Petter be able to find his way through? We're still some way adrift of the 
50% mark in this race, so the pit stops won't be starting for another 10 minutes or so, which means if Philip Hedder wants to gain ground, he's going to have to do it on the track. Now, has he got a good run out of Turn 15 this time around? Because we've seen plenty of overtaking already today into Turns 1 and 2, and you can barely see the Ferrari. is tucked up so close behind the Porsche, and Philip Hedder now ducks out of the slipstream. He's got the inside line, and through he goes. So up into fifth position now goes Philip Hedder. Super move on Patrick Pile, and now it's the turn of Marco Holzer to try and find a way past the Porsche of Patrick Pile. Philip Petter's next target, meanwhile, is Miguel Ramos in the Chevrolet Corvette. Now, I guess we'll get a real indication here, Johnny, as to whether the tyres are just beginning to go away on that Porsche in how quickly Philip Petter drives away from it. At the moment, though, Patrick Pile is giving as good as he's got, and he's trying to fight back and find a way past Philip Petter, but with every corner, that Kessel Racing Ferrari seems to get a tenth or two of Stefano Bizzari is lining up the move on Michael Della Stella and it's Andrea Cecalero, I think, who has lost out with that, who's been forced out wide. So it's Della Stella who is now at the head of the queue of cars. Bizzari has come through as well. There is Cecalero, so he's third in the queue. Eraj Alexander in fourth, and that's an indication really of how you can race very cleanly but very closely. This is just like a, a little Ferrari but one mate championship, isn't it, in the middle of the grid here? And uh, some absolutely fantastic racing, you know, everybody's good names in each other room and uh, we're really seeing some fast, fantastic moves. Uh, I think maybe it might just settle down a little bit. I think everybody's in their order a little bit more now. And a huge dive. And as you Great say move. that, Michele Rugolo launches to the inside of Iraj Alexander, unsuccessfully, as it turns out. And so this train of Ferraris accelerates out of turn nine along towards turn 10 and Michael Dallastella and Stefano Bizzari almost side by side into turn 10. Last time I saw that happen it was Ayrton Senna back in the 1980s at the French Grand Prix. He is really trying here Bizzari and the pair of them now breaking clear of Cecalero and Iraj Alexander. Michele Rugolo also in the mix as well and Steve Yes to the newcomer. He's the six of the cars in this little train. So Dallas Stella having looked so anxious to get through has now really got Pizarro in his tail. We take a replay at this action and, and that's where Cecalero lost that ground. He tried to fight back two tight along the inside. Another chance to relive that move from Philip Petra and that was just a textbook move from Petter. Yeah, he just, he just, you know, you can just see he's letting the car come into him and uh, just saw past the pit, uh, past the commentary box there, he's just starting to to catch the, uh, the Corvette of Ramos as well. And uh, I think the Porsche is just starting to slow down a little bit now. You can see Holster's not really applying too much pressure to Pile either, really. Uh, Pet is just starting to drive away now and, and catch that Corvette. Marco Holster knows he's got a very quick co-driver in the form of Nick Tandy to hand over to as we head back to this fight for fourth in the GTS class. And Dallas Stella sliding through the car and Stefano Bizzari needs no second invitation, but then Dallas Stella back on the switchback. Absolutely brilliant racing between the pair of them. And Michael Dallas Stella, so much confidence in turning the car into the corner because I thought, Johnny, that, that he'd lost his chance there. He slid the rear of the car out of turn 14. Here we see it again. Bizzari to the inside. Jumps on the brakes, Dallas, wow! You couldn't fit a sheet of paper between the rear of Bizzari's car and the front of Dallas Stella's absolutely precision stuff. Yeah, I think he saw that coming uh, a long way. Oh, look at this, a big, big optimistic move there. And, and that's Andrea Cecalero on Stefano Bizzari, so Bizzari has now spun down the field. And that's a great shame, but you almost felt it had to happen. Well, those Ferraris are all running with plenty of company in the meantime. The race leader, Jimmy Brilliant, we haven't talked about him much. He has got a six and a half second advantage at the head of the field over Matteo Malicelli. He comes through and completes his 11th lap of the race. And this is what we've seen in the races that Jimmy Brilliant and Federico Leo have won this year, that Brilliant starts the race and just disappears off into the distance. Malicelli is keeping him fairly honest, though. And then in third place, we've got Andrea Montermini with Miguel Ramos still right onto his turn then Philip Petter trying to close in on Ramos before we get to the two dicing Porsches of Patrick Pile and Marco Holzer who I suspect for the moment and maybe under instructions just to hold station not do anything silly we've still got 45 minutes left in this race for Marco Holzer there's absolutely no prizes for trying something too bold on Patrick Pile there is the third place car on the GTS class that 
is Lorenzo Bontempelli. He's in pursuit of Archie Hamilton, who in turn is following in behind his teammate and the class leader, Matteo Beretta. So it's the two Porsches versus the Ferrari. And Lorenzo Bontempelli, he's a former champion in the GTS class in the National GT Open, and he has just been getting better and better as this season has gone on. Although I imagine to his disappointment there wasn't any gelato in the, the team hospitality unit at lunchtime. He can normally be seen with a big bowl of gelato over lunch break, and that is when you know that he'll go well. Back to the Petr Pile and Holzer battle. And Philip Petri is not pulling away here from Patrick Pile. No, I was just thinking the same there, Ben. It's actually quite surprising. The Ferrari looked like it was just ready to, to slingshot past and get going and get after that Corvette of Ramos there, but... I think he's uh, he's either made the decision to just look after the tyres now and let the race come to them, or uh, or he's actually just you know that's about it really. Maybe maybe he was defended a lot harder than, than what I thought you know at the start of the race there against Holson. I guess the other thing to talk about here is the temperature in the cockpit of these cars because it's 28 degrees outside today, and it's going to be very very warm for these drivers. Yeah, the, you know these cars do get extremely hot. The Ferrari actually out of all the cars that I've ever driven, um, I have to say is probably the coolest and. Uh, I think who we need to be looking, uh, feeling sorry for is the uh, our man uh, in the uh, in the little Aston Martin Vantage. That's a hot, hot car in there, and uh, and certainly he's going to be feeling it uh, for sure. But yeah, plenty of uh, still plenty of high wind, uh, a huge headwind down the front straight um, still, which is probably making things a little bit tricky into the into the really fast turn ten. Yeah, no black livery is not going to make the Aston Martin any cooler, is it, for Matteo Pantacelli? So here's Andrea Montoni and Miguel Ramos. The pair of them have got Philip Petter, who has stayed really a, a couple of seconds behind them ever since finding his way past Patrick Pelle. So those gaps have all remained fairly consistent over the past few laps. The three cars leading the GTS battle, where well, they are still running very, very closely. The, Disappointing thing though for Archie Hamilton is that he has got an extra 15 seconds will be able to his pit stop time, having won at Brands Hatch last time out. In fact, I think he won the first race as well in his class, so he's potentially got 30 seconds extra pit stop time, which will take him well out of that battle. The Ferrari battle, likewise, has also rather settled itself down after that tangle we saw between Cecalero and Bizzari. There is Andrea Cecalero. He's not carrying too many battle scars, it was this very slight of touches with Stefano Pizzari which turned him around for the better along the Mistral straight just now beginning maybe to put over a second on Patrick Pile maybe even a little bit more than that as Marco Holzer holding station behind Patrick Pile and this has been I think a really smart stint from Marco Holzer Johnny because he's been driving very consistently he's not been going for the overtaking moves but he's still got the third and fourth place cars of Andrea Montoni and Miguel Ramos inside. Yeah, I think uh, I think early on maybe he even got a call from the team and uh, and they made the decision for him. Um, he, he was pushing extremely hard to get past the uh, the Ferrari of better early on in the race and uh, we just see now he's just kind of holding station, probably looking after the tyres a little more. Uh, and he's he's aware, you know, after the pit stop, that once Tandy gets in the car, they're going to be uh, shooting right up that field, and uh, you know, the, there's, there's nobody better to come in that Porsche and, uh, and be quick at the end of this race. And with 42 minutes remaining, we are 40% of the way into the race, so the driver change period starts, so the pits will become a buzz as we see these mandatory pit stops. So who's going to be the first to blink and bring in their drivers? Well, as we see Miguel Amaral having another spin. It's been one of those days for Amaral. Unfortunately, the very much gentleman driver, very successful businessman in his native Portugal, Miguel Amaral. Obviously not having such a great day here at Paul Ricard. Well, Patrick Pile, Marco Holzer, of course, both Porsche battery contracted drivers. So they have to bear in mind they will not be very popular if they, they start entangling themselves too much. At the moment, though, they are just running line astern. Holzer following in behind Pile, immaculately prepared cars, both of them, but now holes are just starting through some of those slower corners to ask questions of Patrick Pile, beginning to force Pile to think defensively as we see Miguel Ramos in to hand over to Rafael Giamaria, and this Corvette could go very, very well. They've got a little bit of a pit lane handicap because they were third last time out at Brands Hatch, but Rafael Giamaria, the former Formula 3000 podium finisher, who has race with great success in the international GT Open. He was fourth in last year's championship, third the year before. And so, 
let's see that Corvette, I would venture, challenging for podium positions as this race progresses. It means that Andrea Monturmi is out in some clear air, and he's actually now got a significant advantage before we get to Philip Petter, then Patrick Pile and Marco Holzer. You probably wouldn't expect to see any of those three cars pitting in too early in this pit window, with the exception maybe of Marco Holzer. The Manti Racing Team may be thinking, Johnny, we're a little bit quicker than Pile. We'll bring in Marco, so he's out of the traffic, put Nick Tandy behind the wheel and see what he can do if we can feed him in some empty air. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm quite surprised that they didn't make that call a little sooner, obviously. Um you know, the guys will know where he'll drop back in after the driving change, but it does look like he's just getting a little bit held up by Pele, and uh, I think it would be probably a wise move to just get that pit stop over and done with and uh, release Tandy into some clean air so he can get some really good strong laps in at the start of his stint. Jimmy Bruni is really trying out on the tracks, and he wants to build as much of an advantage as possible over Matteo Malicelli by the time they get to the pit stops. His co-driver Federico Leo may be not quite as quick as Bruni, but he's still equally a match for most of the, the drivers that we'll see out on track in the second half of the race. So it's going to be at least another lap for that pit stop as Miguel Amrao gets out of the number six car. Miguel Angel Del Castro gets in. That's not unsurprising given the two spins, unfortunately, that Miguel Amrao has had in the opening half now of this race. So Pile and holds the gap between them just four tenths of a second. Marco Papelli takes over from Archie Hamilton in the Auto Orlando Sport. Of course, the car was running second in the GTS class. Now they've got a significant pit stop penalty based on their success at Brands Hatch. So ample time for the Auto Orlando Sport team to get to work on that car. Also in, we see the 56 car, and that is Stefano Pizzari to hand over to Andrea Rizzoli. So to a halt comes Pizzari at the AF Course pit box. And so they will take over. So we're probably about a minute away from finding out whether or not we're going to see into the pits this time round any of this battle. Philip Petri is up behind Alexander Taukonitsa Jr. And that's one of the cars that's pitted in Taukonitsa Jr. He's not keen to let Philip Petter through and put the lap onto him. Taukonitsa Jr., a massively improved driver this year, but he runs wide through turn 10. Philip Petter heads past him. Patrick Pile should follow. And Marco Holzer as well in due course, the holes are not quite through yet. Now he comes past Taukonitz Jr., who, as I was saying, has really improved his pace this year. It's the introduction of the paddle shift gearbox into that car, and he's just found it really to his liking. And he's racked up some good results over the course of the season. With really his best weekend last about two eighth places in the car that he shares with his father. Race leader Jimmy Bruni continues on his way, as does Matteo Malicelli in second position. Malicelli will hand over to Alvaro Barber when they make their pit stops. Like any of this group in this lap? No, they're not. They all continue on their way. And actually, you can see maybe why the Manti Racing team haven't brought in Marco Holtz yet, because he and Patrick Pile are closing back in on Filippetta. It does seem that way, yeah, but I think Filippetta lost a little bit of time just getting past that lap traffic there. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, I think it, it's going to be status quo again pretty soon. I think uh, that was just difficult. A, a tough call for Philip Petty, you know, the, at the end of the day, he's trying to get away and, and break that gap and, and really kind of get as much space in, in, in front and behind him as much as possible uh, from Pile. So coming up against the lap traffic is always a, tr always a tricky one. It's very much a balance between, you know, knowing how hard to push, how many risks you can take, uh, and, and knowing really if the, uh, if the lap drivers know that you're coming by. I guess also at this stage of the race, Johnny, you're not necessarily going to know who's in the car you're coming up to lap. No, not at all. This is this strange interim period where, where you just got to be very careful. You don't really know. The race is now a little bit in limbo, and uh, and everybody's just kind of finding the feet again. We've got new drivers coming in. And this is a race of position. It's Andrea Rizzoli, and around the outside goes Marco Mapelli into turn 10. That's an astonishing move from Mapelli. He's gained the place on Andrea Rizzoli. And Mapelli, he had to be held longer in the pits based on his brand's had success. And my goodness, he's pumped up having come out onto the track. And that was a stunning piece of overtaking from Marco Mapelli. Because Andrea Rizzoli did not make that easy for him. They're currently fighting for 14th position through Wemp Mapelli. And he should now be able to pull away from Andrea Rizzoli. 
Yeah, I think it's safe to say he wanted to get by there, isn't it, Ben? I'd look, I'd, I would be intrigued to see uh, just how much of the exit he used on the exit of turn 10 there. Uh, to me, on the screens, it looked like he, he went in extremely fast, and uh, yeah, it'd just be interesting to see how much of that, and if we see any uh, any kind of uh, track limit warning from the marshals here. Seeing then Stephen Hull popping into the cockpit of the number 52 Kessel Racing Club that he shares with Freddie Crane, the pair of them both absolutely adore their racing. Steve Earl, who has been a, a multiple Ferrari America champion back in the late 1990s through the early part of the 2000s before coming to race in Europe, so he will take over that 52 car. As Matteo Malicelli continues in second place in the car that won last time out of the Bilbao Racing, Aston Martin Vantage. I have to say, after qualifying this morning, this isn't maybe the way we've expected this race to pan out, Johnny, because the Aston was looking so strong in relation to Jimmy Brinney and the Ferrari. But for Brinney to have been able to pull out six and a half seconds really is quite remarkable. Yeah, we've just seen a little mistake there from Jimmy. Just went in really a little bit too hot into that first chicane. But I think he, um, I think, you know, Bruni just set a precedent on that first lap. 2.6 seconds. See you later, guys. Off he went, and uh, and I think everybody just maybe just you know thought, well, he's gone. You know, we'll relax him and start our own race. But Jimmy's still pushing really, really hard now. So it's now Massimo Mattavardi who will be handed the keys to the number 53 car from Andrea Cecalero. Cecalero, who I imagine will have a massive smile on his face after that stint because he really was in the thick of the actions. We're just heading towards the, the back end of this pit window. It's going to be open only for another five or so minutes. So we can expect to see the front runners peeling in and, and pitching very shortly. Going back to Jimmy Bruni, Johnny, you talked about that first lap block. From a, a driver's point of view, how difficult is it just to, to just pull the trigger like that and pull out that sort of advantage over one lap on cold tyres? Yeah, I mean, what was interesting to me as well, we saw on the green flag lap, Jimmy was really, really working the tyres and the brakes really hard, making sure that he had plenty of temperature in, such that when that green flag was dropped, you know, he could go. And uh, although the Aston got a great start using the torque down the front straight, uh, you know, Jimmy just sent the message and uh, got past and, uh, and just checked out. So, you know, we can still see he's, he's still pushing like it's the first lap here. So great job by Jimmy Bruni. This, this is just this manoeuvre that I was just talking about. He went really deep, actually touching the cone as well. So we can see just how hard he's pushing. As we now see the second place car into the pits is Alvaro Barber, who will be taking over from Matteo Malicelli. Malicelli has done a super job. He will be pleased, I'm sure, to get a glass of water and sit down in the cold room as it's Alvaro Barber who enters the furnace. Aston Martin replenished with fuel. And Bruni, well, he will go as late into his stint as possible, I think, because Federico Leo, as we've said, he's quick, but he's not quite as quick as Jimmy, and Jimmy wants to give him and the AF course team the best possible chance to win this race. Juan Manuel Lopez, who is driving the second part of the race in the Valor Bacors Ferrari, and in now is the GTS class leading car, and that is Teo Bretta, who is out, Marcello Puglisi, who is into the cockpit. So the pit's very, very busy. So we'll have seen coming out on track as well, Peter Cox and Lamborghini Gallardo. So we'll look to track the progress of Cox. I think also looking at that shot, we've got Philip Pettis there, we've got Marco Holzer, but Patrick Pile, there he is coming out of the pits. He has handed over to Ram on the rack. And look at the way that these pit penalties have played out from Brands Hatch because Ram on the rack is much closer to the second place car of Alvaro Barber and also Juan Manuel Lopez. Yeah, that's really, really, you know, this this is almost like the start of the race again, isn't it, Ben? It's, uh, things have really closed up. It's going to be interesting to see, as you mentioned, Peter Cox there in the in the Lamborghini. You know, he's a quick driver. Um, really good second uh, second qualifying result for him as well. So we know that he's quick. We know that the car's capable. Um, so that'll be really interesting to track his progress throughout this second half of the race. Well, Ram on the rack, French driver, French team. This is going to raise a cheer, as it did with Patrick Pile behind the wheel, because certainly Paul Ricard back in the 1980s when it hosted the French Grand Prix was notorious for its partisan crowds and essentially if it wasn't a Renault that won it wasn't a race worth attending well today will it be the IMSA performance Matt Porsche that comes through his claim of victory I fear that he's going to be a rather tall order for them Juan Manuel Lopez will be looking to go strongly in his stint we will need another couple of laps I think to see 
once all of the front runners have pitted in how the order shakes out as now Olzer is in and it's going to be Nick Tandy who takes over for the German driver so Tandy the former Formula Ford Festival winner and also Formula 3 race winner before making the transition to sports car racing particularly in Porsche he was so successful in the Porsche Super Cup and now in to compete in these GT and endurance races with Porsche where he's proving to be very successful Jimmy Bruni will have to come in either at the end of this lap or next time round so the AF course team running Bruni as late into the race as they can he just flashes the lights to one of the Auto Orlando Sport Porsches to let him know that he's coming and if possible to please let him through the Porsche though seeming too keen on that idea just about of Bruni using all the road a little bit more through turn 10 and he comes right onto the tail of Marcello Pugliese it is he puts the lap on and Bruni has driven every lap of this stitch on the like it's a qualifying lap yeah almost yeah it seems like it I mean I was just thinking there you know that's probably the first car that Jimmy Bruni's actually actually had to pass in his stint and uh, other than the Aston at the start of the race obviously uh, and that's just meant that every single lap's been consistently pulling away pulling away pulling away and they're really well positioned Raphael Jim Rim looking to make the move on Ram on the rack into turn one and through he goes. That's a nice move from Jim Rim who took over in the Corvette very early and that moves him up into eighth position as things currently stand. But that is awaiting the pit stops to play out. So I think that should bring him up to about fourth overall as the race leader is in. So Jimmy Bruni heads down the pit lane to hand over to Federico Leo. They have got. 10 seconds added to their pit stop time and that is because they were second last time out at Brands Hatch Bruni out of the car Federico Leo in but Jimmy Bruni is so finny he races in professional cycle races as a hobby on his weekends off so it'll probably have barely felt the 40 minutes he's just spent behind the wheel no, and also the, the Ferrari is a really really nice car to drive you know you can do hours and hours in that car and almost not feel it it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to drive and I'm sure AF have got that car absolutely perfect as well for him Kessel Racing meanwhile have their pit stop Philip Petter is in to the pit lane it means that Michael Brosnitsky takes over Brosnitsky has got his family and children here cheering him on at lunchtime and in the garage as well now where is that going to play Alvaro Barber back into things we really will find out at the end of this lap what the order is going to look like and then with the 28 minutes remaining in the race who has got the chase to do if they want to finish on the podium in the ninth race of the 2012 international GT Open Championship so the pit window is now closed we've got just under 28 minutes left on the clock we've got one eye towards the monitor here our pit our contra box is just above the garages so there comes Federico Leo he feeds out into the lead of the race so it's Leo who leads it second place is going to be Alvaro Barber then into third position I think it's going to be Michael Brosnitsky so Brosnitsky taking the benefit of staying out deep it's going to be very very tight for third position though we're watching second place car of Alvaro Barber lapping Stephen Earl but there is no Brosnitsky's down to fourth. It's Juan Manuel Lopez who's into third. Brosnitsky fourth. Rafael Jim Rear is in fifth position. Ram on the rack is in sixth. Nick Tandy then in seventh place. But Jim Rear is going to try and make that move. Oh, Brosnitsky as quickly as he can. And through he goes, surging up the inside. And that is another very nicely judged move from Rafael Jim Rear, who has really acquitted himself in the Corvette. This is just his third meeting in the car, having previously raced the Ferrari 4 player, and he is flying, and you wouldn't bet against the podium for Jim Rear today, because his next target is Juan Manuel Lopez. Lopez, who was fifth in last year's championship, with four victories to his credit. He's got a big following back in his native Argentina, but he's now got his work cut out from the flying Corvette, and there was just no stopping Jim Rear then. No, that was a pretty clear message, wasn't it, Ben? He was uh, he was coming through whatever happened there, and uh, straight out of the pits, obviously, the Ferrari, you know, he's, he's just kind of getting to grips with it a little bit, and uh, obviously Leo just uh, just getting into the car now. This is just completing his first lap, and something to note as well that I noticed, uh, the the Ferrari and Philip Peter, they, they pitted with almost only 10, 15 seconds to go before the driver change window, so it'd be interesting to know just how close that was, but uh, couldn't it really fine but obviously paying off as well putting it right back into the mix well, Federico Leo then leading the race after his teammate Jimmy Bruni really put him there after an exceptional stint now 
we will see at the end of this lap what Leo's advantage over Alvaro Barber is and then whether the chase is potentially on in the remaining 25 and a half minutes so through to complete the 20th lap of the race then comes the race leader Federico Leo over the timing beam he comes now here then Alvaro Barber in second position what is the gap going to be as they complete the lap and it is 7.6 seconds the gap from first to second now is that on for Alvaro Barber probably find out at the end of the next lap what about the fight for third position Gia Maria is on the move he has closed right up onto the tail of Juan Manuel Lopez and you wouldn't in this form better against Rafael Gia Maria claiming second position possibly 17 seconds back from the race leader that is probably too tall an order but if he can get past Lopez quickly then who knows what he can do because in this sort of mood Gia Maria is spectacular to watch yeah, he's almost a second quicker than the top five cars there on that lap and uh, an absolutely great opening lap by the Corvette Gia Maria there just uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised you know he, he might have a really good shot at a uh, uh, podium here for especially and uh, who knows what happens at the front we might be seeing him near the, near the top step and Lopez has been badly held up behind Stephen Earl as well through turns five, six, and seven. So onto the Mistral straight. Now I'm going to see the Corvette surging through past Lopez here. They draw side by side. It's three wide as they head down the Mistral straight into the braking zone. An almost contact between Lopez and Earl. So Jim Maria gains the place on Juan Manuel Lopez. Juan Manuel Lopez is back into fourth position. And Rafael Jim Maria leading this battle he's into third he's on the podium now what can he do about chasing down the second place car of Alvaro Barra what can Barber do about Federico, Federico Leo's advantage at the head of the field and that was really very difficult for Juan Manuel Lopez because he was trying to pick his way past Steve Earl he knew he had to do it quickly lest he be held up and three wide down the straight it was advantage Corvette Gia Maria through and already pulling out about a second or so over Juan Manuel Lopez. Yeah, I think we could just see her as, uh, yeah, just jumps on the brakes and uh, and Earl just really had, had almost nowhere to go, so good job for not, not playing straight into the back of the Ferrari there. It's a little bit shades of Jos Verstappen and Juan Montoya at the Brazilian Grand Prix a few years ago when Montoya's battling for the lead. Verstappen were, was just there in the traffic and just misjudged his braking points. We now go to the battle between Mario Cordoni and... Marcello Puglisi and this is in fact the leader of the GTS class it's for eighth overall but it's Cordoni who leads the GTS class because they didn't appear at Brands Hatch they had no additional time in their pit stops unlike the Auto Orlando Sport Porsche so now Puglisi trying to pressurise Cordoni this is a brilliant race as around the outside looks Puglisi well he's in pugilistic move isn't he as they then head on towards turn 15 taking the very tight line is Mario Cordoni looking for the switchback I'm sure will be Puglisi he closes up onto the tail of the Ombra Racing. Ferrari and draws alongside him. They run side by side alongside the finisher. You can see the fists pumping on the pit wall and through into the lead of the class goes Marcello Puglisi. Another absolutely excellent manoeuvre from Puglisi. He takes the lead of the GTS class, having really forced that, that defensive move there from Mario Cordoni. And Puglisi carried the speed on the start and finish straight. And there was really nothing Cordoni could do. No, nice intelligent move there. He set that up right at the last corner, knew where he was going to come from, and uh, and just took full advantage of his exit, using all that Porsche traction that's uh, that we all know about. And uh, yeah, great manoeuvre, and he's he's just going now. So something uh, something to look out for. I think he's just going to head off into the distance now. The tyres look good, the car looks good. I think he's feeling good in the car now. He's just going to check out. But something to note as well that uh, Barber in the in the Aston Martin has taken almost two seconds out of Leo uh, for the second for the first place battle and, uh, and now only six seconds behind so that's uh, that's something to look forward to for 22 minutes to go it's on isn't it that chase for the lead so here is the race leader Federico Leo and are we about to see him completing the lap we are so let's see then in a few seconds time with Alvaro Barbara's done at the wheel of the Villa racing Aston Martin through over the line goes Federico Leo the gap last time was 5.7 seconds the gap this time as the Aston looms large 4.9 and it has come down again quite significantly on that last lap not as much as a lap before but at that sort of schedule it is easily on here for the switch before the end of the race what about Rafael Gia Maria 
he is the quickest of all of them. He was half a second faster still now Varo Barber well, well, well Lopez in fourth position just dropping back from Gia Maria and this is the beauty of the International GT Open for me Johnny that you have these pit stops you have the pit stop penalties and then you have these chases in the second half of the race as the three leaders all closing in on each other yeah I mean you've got the big battles at the front where everybody tries to settle themselves out uh, you know, as we keep on saying, Bruni made a big statement at the start of that race, uh, and that set Leo up for uh, for almost a difficult position now, where whereby he's, he's being chased really hard by the second and third place cars, uh, and it's almost his race to lose. But you know, that's that's not a nice position to be in. You know, he's he's just going to be looking ahead of him, making sure that he stays out of the way of traffic. Fastest speed through the speed trap of anybody in the race on this lap was Alvaro Barber. He's done his personal best, sector one of the race as well. The second place Villa Racing, Aston Martin, is flying. Juan Manuel Lopez in fourth position. Well, he's well set for another very strong finish for the Villalba course. For our team. There's Leo, the race leader, coming towards the end of his 23rd lap. And looming in the background, there he is, is Alvaro Barber. Very shoot. soon they'll be in the same camera shot. And that graphic says it all about the way that that gap has just chipped downwards. So what will it be at the end of this tour of the magnificent Paul Ricard high-tech test track facility? It's in a beautiful part of the world. It's really a very spectacular circuit in a spectacular setting. Out of turn 15 through to complete lap. It was 4.2 seconds the last intermediate point over the line they come and the gap is 3.3 Aston Martin looking ever larger in Federico Leo's mirrors now if you're in Alvaro Barbara's shoes you know what you've got to do you just keep pushing if you're Federico Leo what, what will he be doing at this stage um, he'll be a little bit scared of course uh, but he's going to be pushing himself he's just going to be looking forward uh, and making totally sure that he's just staying out of the way of traffic uh, doing his total best but Barber's in the position of strength there he knows he's faster he's taking you know as we see there just over one and a half seconds a lap uh, in the last three laps you know uh, I think this is almost a foregone conclusion but let's just uh, hold our breath a little bit and, uh, and see what kind of fight Leo can put up you have a delegation from the Bilbao squad coming up to the commentary box here for suggesting it's a foregone conclusion you just absolutely probably hex them now <laughs> with the curse of the commentator as they head along the Mistral straight it is Alan Kalari who is the car they're coming up to lap then in the number 51 machine and one of the beautiful things about the Aston Martin is it is such an aggressive car and, and there's a good spot as well about Marcello Puglisi once he got past Mario Cordoni he's disappeared it is now Marco Mapelli who is looking to repeat the favour and what the result this would be for the Auto Orlando Sport Porsche team if they were to claim first and second in the GTS class he's, looking he's going to be on him in the next corner almost it, absolutely fantastic run out that the uh, the first chicane there and uh, I don't know if the uh, he made a little mistake in the Ferrari but we can see the Porsche is running really well and set of tyres at the stop and, uh, and it's nice and fresh for the second half of the race it's going to have to be a case of Super Mario to keep a very feisty looking Marco Mapelli behind him. We saw Mapelli make that astonishing move through turn 10 on the first lap of his stint, and he's now got the run here on Mario Cordoni out onto the Mistral straight. They come as Michael Brosnitsky comes under pressure from Ram on the rack. That is the battle for fifth and sixth position in the rack, trying to find his way through because every race that Ram on the rack has finished this year, it's been in the top five. They've got the one not finished, and to be honest, it was a non start for them six days ago at Brands Hatch and the rack bobbing and weaving every which way behind Brosnitsky is also enabling Nick Tandy as well in the Manti Racing Porsche to close in so these three cars have been so equal on pace throughout the duration of this race they have got just over a quarter of an hour with which to sort themselves out and the rack carrying a lot of speed out of turn 15 really wide over the curbs a good illustration there as well Johnny you were saying earlier on how flat those curbs are all four wheels the curb from Ram on the rack, but it wasn't quite enough to propel himself past the Kessel Racing Ferrari en route towards turn one. So he seems to find his way through. And here is the move we saw being set up from Marco Mapelli to the inside of Mario Cordoni. Nothing that Mario could do. So it's Mapelli who moves second in the GTS class and Cordoni back into third in the class. If I'm honest, I'm, uh, I'm surprised at the pace of Tandy. I thought he might be 
getting a little bit quicker. As I say, that just uh, poses his, uh, his fastest lap of his stint and out of the car this race, actually. So I don't know if uh, maybe a little bit of pickup on the tyres or something, which he's been clearing for those last few races, a uh, few laps there. Uh, but it seems like he's just picking up the pace a little bit now, and maybe you can just see the, uh, the Ferrari being hunted down uh, ahead of him. And this could also be the, the team strategy to run to a pace, thinking if we run to that pace the first 50 minutes, we'll manage the tyres as Narak thought about looking at the inside of Brosnitsky. Brosnitsky, though, holds his line, does everything right, doesn't go overly defensive in two turns, eight and nine. So out onto the second half of the Mistral straight. In the meantime, to bring up the state with the leaders, it's now just 2.2 seconds between Federico Leo and Alvaro Barba. What about Ram on the rack? through turn 10 on towards turn 11 he's got to run here on Brosnitsky but no Brosnitsky moves across he takes a very early apex for turn 11 so there's nothing doing there but then he runs a little bit wider than again the rack tries to take the very tight line through the second phase of the corner on towards the left hand return 12. We can see Brosnitsky is really starting to drive in his mirrors now and uh, making a couple of mistakes and uh, the rack is uh, certainly got the car underneath you know i won't be surprised if he tries to just set him up in this last turn here for a good run down the front straight into the first turn and this is an interesting man to watch because michael brosnitsky and ramon the rack i would say are two of the very best gentleman drivers in the business they're not professional racing drivers but they are running with top top teams at a very high pace but the has got the run on brosnitsky this time around along to complete lap where will he duck out of the slip street behind the ferrari he comes out nice and early he's got the inside line in towards turn one but brosnitsky has the confidence through turn one again he chops across the bowels of ram on the racks so there's no way through there for the rack out of turn two accelerating along this short curving straight towards turn three and this first section of that brosnitsky seems very comfortable it's then really when they come out of turn seven onto the mistral straight where the rack starts to gain ground i think we've seen all race the uh, the porsche is extremely strong on the brakes um, you know, that big white tie now that the, the new uh, 2012 spec uh, GT car's got now. Uh, but, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised again. I think Narak knows where Bros Brosnitsky is struggling. Uh, and that seems like he's in the slow speed corner. So near the end of the lap, I think he's going to have maybe have a little uh, another go and uh, be a little bit more forceful this time into the braking area of Turn 1. Just wonder if he's going to have a go even sooner. That into Turn 8, he draws out of the slip stream. He's got the inside line. He's going to break very, very deep. And through he goes, round on the rack gains the place up into fifth position with again a nicely judged move he really took his time over that and Brozanitsky unfortunately left with no answer and all the while that battle has brought Nick Tandy into the mix so I just wonder if it's only going to be a matter of time before Tandy goes through we see it from another angle textbook slipstream maneuver it maneuver really inside line into the chicane from the rack and through went back to the leaders and Leo is being caught by Alvaro Barber that gap is coming down and down and down it was 1.6 seconds at the end of the last lap it looks like it hasn't actually come down a great deal more than that this time around so through to complete the lap then is Federico Leo Alvaro Barber in pursuit behind him and if anything in fact the gap has gone out eight tenths of a second which it's an indication as well, Johnny, that Barber is pushing very hard at the wheel of that Aston Martin. Yeah, Barber, uh, looking at his lap times there, Leo was running a low 11, high 10, like he's been running uh, since he jumped in the car, but uh, Barber had a really quite slow lap, losing about two seconds on average to, to where he's been at previously. So I don't know if he had a bit of a mistake or maybe some traffic, uh, but the gap's still at two and a half seconds. And he lost all of that time as well through the second sector of the lap, so it could have just been a slight instance about breaking himself into the turn eight and nine chicane along the Mistral straight it could equally be as well that Aston Martin is just eating up its tires slightly with 12 minutes to go the battle for fifth sixth and seventh continues to be very competitive it's now the turn of Nick Tandy to pressurize Michael Brosnitsky for sixth position Tandy right onto the tail of the Kessel Racing Ferrari. He's going to enable Ram on the rack in fifth to try and escape and maybe even set off in pursuit of Juan Manuel Lopez in fourth position. I think that's a little bit too much to ask for the rack, but Tandy has got a good run now along the Mistral straight into the chicane. Is he going to be very, very bold on the brakes here? He's got the inside line and through he goes. He really forces the issue. Nick Tandy up into sixth position. He comes. 
and that move had a lot lower margin for error than the move we saw the lap earlier from the rack because Tandy was very late on the brakes. Uh, Brosnitsky was trying to turn in, but he found the Manti Racing Porsche there on the inside line. Nothing you could do, and Tandy gaining the place. Uh, as you can see, Brosnitsky here was uh, a little bit more wary of, uh, of that Porsche coming up the inside of him this lap, and uh, but losing two places in this many laps. And, uh, you can see it's a, it's a good move by Tandy. He was really late on the brakes, but kept it nice and steady and, uh, and managed to get a really nice clean exit onto the straight. So he's going to be straight in uh, Iraq now. And uh, Iraq's now going to be seeing his car full of Porsche mirrors. Well, though, seventh place, Michael Brosnitsky. It's solid championship points. And we are still only just at over the halfway stage of the season because from Paul Ricard this weekend we have the month of August off before going to the Hungara Ring at Monza in September before the season rounds off Barcelona the first weekend of November. The gap between the leaders, meanwhile, out of our sight has come down to 1.3 seconds on that last lap. So whatever issues Alvaro Barbara had seems to suggest it was a mistake more than anything else in the second place Aston Martin all about the battle for fifth sixth and seventh is Nick Tandy going to be able to get on to terms with Ramon the rack it's really a repeat of what happened for Marco Holzer in the first half of the race up behind Patrick Pile he's able to match the pace of the Porsche but not get past it here is the fight for the lead then and Alvaro Barber is on the tail of Federico Leo that chase has taken about 15 minutes but now Barber is on to Leo's tail and he's got nine minutes with which to find his way past that race leading Ferrari now when will he be able to do it well after qualifying there were there were real rumblings in the paddock that the Aston Martin would just be able to power past on the Mistral straight we're not seeing any evidence of this this time around as they head to route turn 10 on towards turn 11 and now Johnny is it a different discipline here for Barber he's done the chasing now he's got to pick the perfect moment to make the move on Leo yeah I don't think he you know he's not quick enough that he's going to just drive past um, I think the car the Aston Martin is very quick in a straight line obviously this is a, a danger with obviously with the lap traffic now as well but I think we can see the Aston Martin I, I noticed was a little bit heavy on its tires uh, turn six he was he seemed like he was struggling quite a bit but let's see coming on to this front straight now let's just see how quick this Aston Martin is you almost thought about the move into turn 15 as well didn't he so this is to complete lap 28 eight and a quarter minutes remain accelerating along the front straight and are we going to see the move here from Barbary's Bobby you even mind though who just plants the car on the inside of the road he's going to make Barber do this the hard way and drive right on the outside of him and Barber is able to do it and into the lead of the race goes Alvaro Barber around the outside of turn one super move for Alvaro Barber he snatches the lead away from Federico Leo and the power of the Aston Martin well we thought he got it at his, his disposal and he was able to surge through in the end past Federico Leo, but now can Leo fight back through some of the more technical sections of this Paul Ricard circuit because he really does gain a little bit of ground through turns three and four on the tail of Alvaro Barber, but then the run down the Mistral straight, you would think we're playing to the hands of the Aston Martin. We're about to find out, out of turn six, and into turn seven they come. Another look at the move for the lead, Johnny. Yeah, there's no more that Leo could have done there. You know, he stuck his car on the inside of the track as early as he possibly could, and the, uh, the Aston Martin just uh, not shy of a few, a few horsepower there, just absolutely drove past him in a straight line. And, uh, yeah, not much more he can do, but Tandy right on the back of Narak now. Wherever you look in this race, there are battles going on throughout the field. It has been one of the races of the season from the International GT Open, and it is still not over yet because we've got this fight for fifth position between Ramon the Rack and Nick Tandy fighting for Porsche honours. They've got some traffic in the forms on the GTS cars coming up ahead of them. It's Martin Lanting who and Cedric Mezar who are the two that they're coming onto the tail of. As Mario Cordoni, third in the GTS class, has a spin. Fortunately, he has about half a minute over Daniel Zampieri, who's fourth in class. So that shouldn't cost him his spot on the class podium is now Tandy really turning up the pressure on Ram on the rack through turn 10 and the rack has to go defensively towards turn 11 but Tandy jigs the inside line he tries to force his way through he's still got the inside line for the second half of turn 11 and now he does make the move or does he know around the outside the rack keeps his foot in they accelerate out of turn 11 on towards turn 12 and still the Frenchman just prevails over the British driver 
out of turn 12 on towards turn 13. And I really thought that Tandy got that move done, but the rack was equal to it. Very bold driving. Yeah, great piece of, uh, of defensive drive there by Narak, and uh, without slowing himself down too much, you know, he was able to hold off Tandy, but I'm surprised Tandy really is trying to get past in those places, you know, it's uh, it's difficult, you're, you're going to blow the tyres, the front tyres, there's only five minutes left of the race, of course, so of course he's uh, you know eager to get past as soon as possible, but I think the car may be, uh, may be setting him up through turn six for a great run through turn seven down the minstrel into the hairpin. Or well, the chicane, should I say, down the main straight, that might be a better place. And uh, let's see if he goes for that this time. Well, up behind Cedric Mazar now, who they're looking to put a lap on, and this might just assist Nick Tandy. As Tandy closes up behind Ram on the rack and jinx the inside, and he is able to go through. He takes advantage of Mazar just boxing in slightly Ram on the rack. So now Nick Tandy is up into fifth position, but he in turn is struggling to get past Frenchman Cedric Mazar. That is enabling Ram the Rack to get back onto his tail. They both finally force their way through. It's Martin Lanting who is their next target. But Tandy is there in fifth position and will try and drive away from Ram on the Rack. They've also still got not too far back as well Michael Brosnitsky along the Mistral straight. That is Brosnitsky bringing himself into the mix. I think he's rather a shortening of the angle onto the tail and past Lanting goes Nick Tandy but Narak can't go through as well and that really does settle it in favour of Nick Tandy as Brosnitsky now takes his opportunity to come back at the IMS performance map with Porsche. Yeah nice opportunistic move here using the Narak and just got kind of out of sight and, uh, and held up by the Ferrari there and uh, Tandy was straight up the outside uh, down the inside no hesitation whatsoever great move really forceful uh, and no contact as well so really good move there by Tandy awful lot there that Ram the Rack could do. It's pretty nervous stuff, isn't it, in the garages watching on on the monitors. Now, will the Rack be able to hold on to sixth position because Michael Brosnitsky seems to have got a bit of a second wind here and he's coming back at the Porsche. As they dispute sixth and seventh, it's enabling Nick Tandy in fifth to drive away. I just wonder whether Tandy might have a little bit more grip at his disposal having managed those tyres because we saw Patrick Pile pushing pretty hard in the early stage of the race and I suspect that the rack is probably left with not a huge amount of grip. Yeah, I noticed that Brusnitsky actually was uh, was you know, coming up for half a second quicker than uh, the two Porsches ahead of him there for the last couple of laps and I didn't know whether that was just a kind of a, them holding each other up but it seems that Brusnitsky now might just have a car underneath him to make a challenge in these last few laps. He could well do. We've got just three minutes remaining in the race. It's Alvaro Barber who leads it from Federico Leo with Raffaele Giamaria in third position. So three different marks in the top three places. This is the battle for sixth position between Ram on the Rack in the Porsche and then the, the Ferrari of Michael Brosnitsky. The Rack and Pile yet to win a race this year. Brosnitsky and Philip Petter, the drivers of the Ferrari, they won exactly seven days ago in torrential rain at Brands Hatch. Completely different conditions greeting the drivers on the south coast of France this weekend here at Paul Ricard. Tandy probably a couple of seconds now clear of that fight for sixth position. His job is done. He's in fifth. He's five and a half seconds back from Juan Manuel Lopez in fourth. He won't bring that down between now and the Czech and flag which is just a couple of minutes away. So at the end of this lap, we will see Alvaro Barber going in to the final lap of the race. Are we in a position for the change for sixth? This time around, no, we're not. The Porsche prevailing through turn 10 as into turn 15 for the penultimate time. Then comes the race leader, Alvaro Barber. He accelerates along the start to finish straight to start the final lap of what has been a perfectly judged race from the Bilbao Racing Aston Martin team. And let's not forget here, they had to overcome a 15 second addition to their time in the pit stop, which was five seconds longer in the pit stop. They had than this car, the Federico Leo car, in second position. They were first and second in the eighth race of the season at Brands Hatch, and that looks like the way they're going to finish in the ninth race of the season as well here at Paul Ricard. And it is a remarkable achievement in the International GT Open to claim two victories in a row. And that is what it looks like it's going to be for Matteo Malicelli and Alvaro Barber. Federico Leo 
and Jimmy Brittany, they are starting to really get some consistency into their championship challenge. Now just uh, looking at the time screens there as well, Ben. Uh, Federico Leo doing his, his fastest first sector of that lap. Um, it seems like once he had the Aston Martin in front of him, he's been going best part of the second a lap quicker. So what might have been if he'd uh, if he'd been able to pull those laps out of the bag earlier on and, uh, and maybe would have uh, had a Ferrari lead in at this point. It's so often the case though, isn't it? You sometimes don't know how quickly you can go until you're following in behind a car that's going very competitively. Well, Rafael Giovaria has put together an absolutely storming drive today, really fighting his way up into third position in that Chevrolet Corvette, which is therefore going to give us the exact same podium that we had six days ago at Brands Hatch. So as we hit the midway stage of the season, these are the cars that are really moving up to be the cream of the crop at the top of the field. Yeah, you can just see on the screens there where uh, Leo's only losing about half a second a lap at the end there, whereas uh, the previous laps it was almost, you know, one and a half to two seconds. So uh, either the car had a small issue or, or he's just uh, used the Aston Martin as a bit more of a marker and uh, managed to drag himself up. But he's... Uh, he's well, he, he's managed the pace, but unfortunately he's not been able to catch the Aston Martin. So it's celebration for the Vilmar squad once more, accelerating out of the final turn to take the chequered flag. And it's Alvaro Barber and Matteo Malicelli who win two on the bounce. Second place goes the way of Federico Leo and Jimmy Bruni. Handshakes all around from the team on the pit wall. All of the hard work really paying off Malicelli being hoisted off by his team and then third place to Miguel Ramos and Rafael Giamria in the Corvette. Fourth place to Juan Manuel Lopez but then winning the GTS class it's been a, a very fine drive from Matteo Beretta and Marcello Puglisi. It's Puglisi who will take the chequered flag in the Auto Orlando Sport Porsche who are pretty much going to finish in formation here because Marco Mapelli has really closed in the past few laps onto the tail of Puglisi so it's going to be delight for the team knocking out the top two runs on the GTS podium. Don't think that we're going to see Mapelli making the challenge on Puglisi in the final couple of corners. Certainly for the, the team on the pit wall, they'd rather not see that happen. So out of the final corner then comes Marcello Puglisi. He is going to win the class with immediately behind him his teammate Marco Mapelli to the light of the Auto Orlando Porsche team. Well, it's been, Johnny, an absolutely fantastic race, this one. Battles throughout the field for the whole 70 minutes. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, for me, I think uh, the driver there of the race, for me, has got to be Bruni in that first lap. You know, he, he, he set that car up to, uh, to win the race, and uh, they almost did it. You know, just 1.4 seconds on the line. It was very, very close at the end there. Uh, with the Ferrari actually coming back on the Aston Martin in the, last, in the closing laps. So uh, it's going to be an interesting one for uh, for race two, certainly uh, with, with Bruni in the car at the end. Uh, but great result for the guys uh, in the Aston Martin squad. And uh, they certainly drove a really intelligent race there and the, and the car showing its speed for sure. Well, if you are watching us live on our web stream, then just a reminder that tomorrow's race, the 10th race of the season, gets underway at one o'clock local time so that's 1300 hours paris time if you're watching from the uk then that is midday so make sure you watch the 10th race of the season from the international gt open before maybe you turn your attention to the action in germany that comes a little bit later on in the afternoon from the formula one so let's take a check then at the provisional classification with the win for alvaro barbara matteo malicelli second place to federico leo and jimmy Bruni, third place to miguel ramos and rafael jim rear andrea montermini and juan manuel lopez in fourth marco holzer and nick tandy in fifth with then the rack and pile in sixth brosnitsky and petter in seventh then Breta and puglisi winning gts in eighth position marco mapelli and archie hamilton second in the class in ninth and then Mario Cordone having problems late in the race, promoting Daniel Zampieri and Michael Dallastella up to complete the top 10 and also to complete the GTS podium. And yeah, there is confirmation of the problems for Cordoni, finishing some four laps down, and that puts him in 20th position. Well, Jimmy Bruni setting the fastest lap of the race as well, a 2 minutes 8.066 for Bruni. He had the pace in the first half of the race, but Alvaro Barber really closing this second half and that means that Barbara Malicelli moved back to the top of the International GT Open Championship they're 10 points clear of Nick Tanzi and Marco Hulsruf just got three points over Federico Leo and Jimmy Bruni 
in fifth and sixth positions. Pile and Narak, who were leading going into Brands Hatch last weekend, they fall to seventh and eighth in the championship. But they've got a reasonably healthy advantage then over Andrea Montermini and Juan Manuel Lopez, who have just got a couple of points over Philip Petter and Michael Brozanitsky. The crowd here basking in the sunshine at Paul Ricard. I'm sure we'll be giving the drivers a very, very big cheer when they come onto the podium. Rafael Maria gets the congratulations from the team as he clambers out of the Chevrolet Corvette to score his second straight podium in that car. And those guys had quite a lonely race, didn't they? You know, they were just settled in at the start and uh, and just ran the, ran the laps and uh, a great result there. Look at all the Aston Martin guys, really happy with the result there. And uh, yeah, really good race win. Alvaro Barber absolutely overjoyed with that. And you wouldn't know that he'd just spent the best part of the 35 minutes at the wheel of that Aston Martin Vantage video. He's bouncing around with energy. There's Matteo Malicelli, his co-driver. He's having a quick debrief and a handshake. Of course, they've got it all to do tomorrow. Well, Gia Maria, for me, one of the stars of the race, those overtaking moves he made early in his stint were absolutely spectacular. As he and Miguel Ramos debrief on their performance. Alvaro Barber removes his helmet, hands, device, and balaclava. Shows how fit these drivers are, Johnny. He's barely broken sweat. He's only done 35 minutes, Ben. He needs to get himself to Le Mans and do three and a half hours. I think that's what it is. <laughs> but no, uh, no, these guys are uh, yeah, for sure training and uh, making sure that they're absolutely on the game because, you know, although this is a 70-minute race, this is absolutely a sprint race um, and everybody's pushing. You can see that every single lap, pushing as hard as they possibly can. Uh, so, yeah, really, really great job. And uh, I'm looking forward to, next, uh, to the next race. I think this should be a good one. I think it really should be. Well, all of our podium finishers have driven on the limit for the duration of the 70-minute race. The second race that comes tomorrow, that is the short race of the weekend. That is the 50-minute race. As the crowd here heading off for some well-deserved refreshment after an enthralling and thrilling race from the International GT Open. And, and this, Johnny, it is why GT racing endures as being such a, a draw for crowds across the world because yes, they were running at sprint race pace, but the race unfolded, developed, had twists and turns all the way through the 70 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, especially here with the GT Open Championship, with the rules, with the with the pit stop penalties and everything, it, you know, we saw that all mix up in the middle of the race there. And although, you know, Bruni had a, a huge lead, what it was at, at the start of the race, um, that was quickly abolished. And uh, and then the Aston Martin was, was able to, to gather that up with its straight line advantage. and. The Porsches were strong at the race at the start of the race, obviously with the with their greater grip and, and tire warming capabilities. But for sure, it makes just for a really interesting time, and, and certainly watching it from the outside perspective now, you know, when you when you're there as a driver, um, it's it's quite a different feeling. But from here, just seeing all the the times and seeing everything come together, and it's really really quite obvious what the the strengths of the cars are, and also the drivers playing and driving intelligently as well. And uh, I think we saw that uh, mostly from the from the Aston Martin there as well. They were really uh, just took the pace and, um, and, and let the race come to them. Drivers then all congregating, ready to be announced onto the podium here for the ninth race of the 2012 International GT Open season and the second race win for Alvaro Barber and Matteo Malicelli very different circumstances the one so a chance to look then at some of the highlights from the race it was a lively start through turn one we saw some brilliant battling amongst the Ferraris in the GTS class. Stefano Bizzari and Andrea Cecalero exchanging places. Likewise, Philip Petter pulling a super move on Patrick Pile. This was, for me, one of the moves of the race. Michael Dallastella slightly rear of the car. Bizzari squeezing through, then Dallastella fighting back in what was a frenetic battle. Unfortunately, 
Sari eventually was tagged by Andrea Cecalero, and that spun him to the back of that group. Here was another very bold move. That was for third place. Rafael Giamria up the inside of Juan Manuel Lopez. And Lopez also trying to squeeze past Stephen Earl. That was what eliminated Mario Cordoni from third place in the GTS class, as we saw the battle race long between the two Porsches and the Kessel Racing Pro, Felipe Petra Michael Brosnitsky. Here was the move for the lead. Alvaro Barber around the outside of Jim Maria Bruni. And Barber, having taken that lead, was able to hold the advantage through to the checker flag to claim he and Matteo Malicelli's second victory of in a row in the International GT Open. National anthems then on the podium in honor of the winning team. Milwa Racing, their drivers Alvaro Barbara and Matteo Malicelli on the top step of the podium. It's Federico Leo and Jimmy Bruni on the second rung of the rostrum. And then receiving their trophies in third place, Miguel Ramos and Rafael Giamaria. The applause of the crowd, which has gathered to watch on the other side of the pit straight opposite the podium. Second place trophies then. They're, of course, Ferrari pairing. It's a very, very solid performance. And then our race winners, Matteo Malicelli and Alvaro Barba, with the Constructors' Trophy about to be presented to Bilwar Racing. Well, now that the business of racing is done, it's the battle to get to the champagne cork. Mega Ramos first off the mark today. I think the drivers, though, trying to keep those race suits reasonably dry, so they get it doused with champagne ahead of the second race of the weekend. Opportunity to see in beautiful slow motion the poise of the Chevrolet Corvette being driven on the limit en route to third position. Jimmy Bruni and Federico Leo pushed so hard in that Ferrari, but unfortunately they lost out in the end by just 1.4 seconds to the race-winning Aston Martin of Alvaro Barba and Matteo Malicelli. The Bilwa squad have got that car working absolutely perfectly, although for the second race of the weekend, they will now have 30 seconds added to their pit stop time. As a result of two wins on the bounce, well, thumbs up and unsurprisingly there from Auto Orlando Sport as they prepare for the GTS podium because they have got the top two steps on the rostrum. A perfect day for Matteo Bretta and Marcello Puglisi. And the GTS class, Johnny, again, giving us plenty of action entertainment through the race. Yeah, I mean, uh, that middle period of the race there where we had, uh, what was it, five or six Ferrari, four, five, eights all running together. That was just incredible. You know, the guys were uh, absolutely on it and uh, paying lots of respect until, uh, until the little cheeky manoeuvre into the first first uh, first corner there. But no, really, really great racing throughout the field today. And um, yeah, I, think, uh, I think everybody can uh, just have a rest easy now after this one and uh, look forward to tomorrow. So third on the GTS podium, it's Daniel Zampieri and Michael Dallas Stella. Second place, Marco Mapelli and Archie Hamilton. And our GTS winners, Matteo Beretta and Marcello Puglisi with the winning team being Auto Orlando Sport. Trophies being presented to the drivers and also to the winning team. Trophies presented then to Puglisi and Beretta. Constructors, team's trophy to Auto Orlando Sport, which brings to them then 
our coverage of the ninth round of the 2012 International GT Open here at Paul Ricard. We've got the second race of the weekend to look forward to tomorrow. That gets underway at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. In the meantime, for myself, Ben Evans and Johnny Cocker, it's goodbye and until next time. Sorry?